Okay, so I'd like to thank Jan and Lam Action for giving Arrow and I the opportunity to talk about research today. What am I looking for? There it is. Um, and the way we're going to split this bit is I'm going to talk about what seems to be important to LAM researchers around the world at the moment um, insofar as finding new therapies for LAM. And that's the first half of the talk. And then Arrow is going to talk about some of the work that she's been doing in, in the, the lab on LAM. She's a LAM Action funded PhD student. Um, so I know Simon's giving you an introduction to LAM this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about the cell biology of LAM, about what, what's going wrong within the cell when you have LAM, because that's where a lot of the ideas for these new therapies have come from. Um, all right, this looks kind of complicated, but just bear with me for a second. The protein that isn't working properly is this protein here. It's called tuberin. Um, it doesn't normally spin like that. Um, tuberin has a function, a very important function. It senses what the environment of the cell is like. Are there lots of nutrients? Are there lots of growth factors? Is everything good? Should I grow? And if it thinks the cell should grow, then um, it allows these two complexes, mTORC1 and mTORC2, to work. And these complexes, a pathway comes down from them and it allows the cell to grow, to proliferate, to grow, to survive. If tuberin thinks that actually conditions are not so great, the cell should not grow, it acts as a break on these two proteins. It says stop working, the cell stops growing, it stops proliferating until conditions are better. What happens if you have LAM is tuberin doesn't work. The cell doesn't know what its environment is like and it carries on growing when it shouldn't grow. Um, because we identified these pathways, and by we I mean the LAM research community, um, as being the targets of tuberin, immediately there was a, a potential therapy for LAM and that is Sirolimus, which is rapamycin, which was already known to inhibit this protein. And we know that rapamycin um, is a good therapy for LAM. Last week, it was um, on the 28th of May, it was approved as a treatment for LAM. Um, it doesn't work for absolutely everyone, but most people respond. And there's a recent paper which has followed patients for five years on rapamycin, on sirolimus. And in those five years, the lung function has stabilized and the cysts haven't got any worse in their lungs. Um, so what the authors conclude is that over that time, it's still functional. There's no resistance builds up. As long as you take it, it carries on working. They say that the side effects, although considerable, are managed by most patients. But the problem with rapamycin, sirolimus, is you have to keep taking it. If you stop taking rapamycin, then the disease continues to progress. We need something else. Rapamycin itself is not a cure. Not everyone responds. If you do respond, you need to keep taking it. We need something else to just finish these cells off in combination with rapamycin. And what I'm going to talk to you about now is what, other, what people are looking at that may be used in combination with rapamycin to just finish these cells off once and for all. Um, the reason rapamycin may not be completely working for LAM, may not be a cure, is, is reasonably evident if you look at this diagram. There are these two pathways that come down from tuberin that go wrong if you don't have tuberin working properly. Rapamycin, sirolimus, only works on this half. There's another pathway here which rapamycin doesn't touch. So it's this pathway which is still running in an uncontrolled way the problem. And we can inhibit this pathway. And we can inhibit it with simvastatin, which is great because simvastatin is already one of the most heavily prescribed drugs in the world. Um, it's a statin which is used to lower your cholesterol levels. Some of you might already be aware of that, I guess. Um, so I'm going to talk for a little bit about statins and LAM. And I'm going to talk about some of the research work um, on, on statins. So there have been quite a few papers about statins and LAM. Um, the conclusions at the moment seem to be that it does matter which statin you take. Simvastatin, but not atorvastatin, seems to stop cells with a mutation in tuberin from growing, which is just what we want. It causes them to die, which is what, what rapamycin doesn't seem to be able to do. And if you have rapamycin and simvastatin together, you get a much stronger effect. This also, simvastatin also works 
This, these experiments were done on cells in a dish. It also works in a mouse model of lamb. It's very important to show that actually this works in a whole animal as well as just in cells on a dish. And I've actually put some of the data from this paper into, um, into the talk just to show you a little bit about what we do. So this, these are very simple experiment. You take some cells and you count how many you have at the beginning. And then you give them increasing amounts of your drug and after a period of time, you count them again and you see how many you've got left. If you give the cells a tour of a statin, you can see that the cell number goes down a little bit, but it, it doesn't go down a huge amount. But with simvastatin, as you increase the dose, you see more and more of the cells die. These are two different kinds of cells which have loss of tubrin. These are human lamb-derived cells. They show the same effect. As you increase the dose of simvastatin, you lose the cells. If you give this, I'll just show you simvastatin with rapamycin, actually now that's rapamycin on its own, maybe half the cells die with rapamycin. With simvastatin, as soon as you add simvastatin, you are killing many more cells. So this is the lab work that the patient trials are going to be based on. So there's already been a very small study, just 14 patients, um, who were taking both simvastatin and rapamycin. And in fact, this very small study didn't show any additional benefit of having simvastatin. But the authors weren't despondent at all. They say, it's fine, it's a small study. The patients had quite mild lamb. It does show that it's safe to take these drugs together, which is in itself very important. So now there is a trial, the SOS trial, to see if simvastatin and rapamycin can be taken together. And also they'll be measuring lung function in these patients. So we'll have some idea of whether that combination of drugs is effective. Um, now this is a bit of a buzzword in lamb, and it has been for a while, autophagy. This is another pathway I'm going to talk about that's going to be targeted. Autophagy means self-eating. What the cell can do if conditions get really tough is it can start eating itself. It can eat its own components to keep itself going. It's a survival mechanism to get it over the very worst of times. So autophagy, self-eating. And this is kind of what happens within the cell. It's a cartoon of what happens in the cell when it starts to eat itself. There's a whole load of proteins involved in this. One is this ulk complex. Then the cell puts the, the little structures it doesn't want anymore into a bubble. It fuses that with another bubble of enzymes and the enzymes degrade everything in the bubble and then what the breakdown products can be used for the cell for metabolism to continue, to continue life. So this ulk complex here is in this pathway. And actually, mTOR stops ulk from working. It stops autophagy, because if everything is fine, you don't need to eat yourself. You've got plenty to eat from the outside. You only really want to set off this pathway if things are bad. But the problem is, if you give a patient rapamycin, you stop mTOR from working. And suddenly, this pathway here can now just go. You've set off autophagy, cell eating in your cells. You've actually given them a way to survive under difficult conditions when what you're really trying to do is kill them. So what is now being thought is that by inhibiting this protein, mTORC, this complex, we're allowing the cells to survive because you we're allowing them to undergo autophagy. So now we need to stop autophagy. That's the next thing. And luckily, there are already drugs which can do that. I'm going to talk about two, um, chloroquine and resveratrol. You might have heard of resveratrol in some other contexts, I think. Um, so inhibitors of autophagy, chloroquine. Um, it's an anti-malarial drug. It's been used for ages. It's falling out of favor a bit now, I think, because mosquitoes have sussed it slightly and they're getting resistant. So, But it has a long history of use, which is great. Um, and in one study from Lisa Hensky's lab, and I'm quoting from their paper, the combination of both drugs, again, they're talking about rapamycin and chloroquine together, more significantly inhibits the survival, i.e. kills, TSE2 deficient cells, those are cells which don't have tubrin working, compared with either agent alone. The same story is with simvastatin. If you use chloroquine with rapamycin, they are more effective. Um, it also, again, works in mice, which is another important step. And there is, again, another clinical trial ongoing, the SAIL trial, where they're going to use a combination of sirolimus and a chloroquine derivative in lamb and, and measure lung function. So the second 
inhibitor of autophagy is resveratrol. Uh, resveratrol, if you try to find any sensible information about resveratrol on the web, what you tend to find is that it has life-extending uh, life properties. So a lot of people take it uh, because it's, it's apparently it will increase your lifespan, which is great. Um, it, comes from, it comes from red grapes, and you could, it's a health food supplement at the moment. But there is a lot of mainstream scientific literature on resveratrol and its role in life extension and its role in various diseases, including cancer, and it's an inhibitor of autophagy. So one particular group, Marina Holtz's group, are very interested in resveratrol because of its role in inhibition of autophagy. And what I've put here are some pictures from one of Marina's papers. These are cells. They're called MEFs, mouse embryo fibroblasts. These at the bottom don't have any working tuberin, so these are like your lamb cells. The ones at the top are absolutely fine. And what Marina's group have done is they've added rapamycin on its own. Cells are pretty, pretty fine with just rapamycin. Resveratrol on its own. Again, these are looking a bit hairy, but they're basically fine. And then rapamycin with resveratrol. And what they find is the combination, again, of the two drugs kills these cells, kills the cells that don't have functional tuberin. But it doesn't kill the cells that do have functional tuberin. So actually, that's quite nice and selective. Um, so, to quote again from the paper, because rapamycin is an FDA-approved drug, rapamune has already been approved for use in lamb, and resveratrol is a widely available nutritional supplement, which it is, um, it would be quite straightforward now to set up a clinical trial using resveratrol with rapamycin in the same way as they have with simvastatin and rapamycin and chloroquine and rapamycin. So these are all combinations of drugs with rapamycin to just finish these cells off once and for all. So, and then just very briefly, I'm going to allude to um, what Steve Hammers was talking about in his talk, which is why do only women get lamb? We don't know, we just don't know. We, it must be estrogen, um, but historically anti-estrogen therapies have not worked quite as well as you would hope they would. Um, so aromatase inhibitors are the next thing. And as, as was in the talk, these stop the production of estrogen in postmenopausal women, but not in premenopausal women, where you get a lot of estrogen from the ovaries. So the theory is that as well as tuberin not working, you also need estrogen to get lamb. You need those two things working together. We know that lamb cells have estrogen receptors, so they can sense estrogen, they can respond to it. And anti-estrogen therapies work very well, for example, for breast cancer and prostate cancer, but they just haven't to date worked very well for lamb. But a recent trial, which is a trail trial, um, has just finished recruiting. Now, Steve said that they haven't recruited many patients, um, so it may be that we don't get enough information from that particular study to work out whether they work. But these patients were postmenopausal and they were already taking an aromatase inhibitor. So we'll see in maybe in a year or so what the results from that study are. Even if it's a small study, it'll be useful to know what, what the data are. And now I'm going to get to the bit that our lab is really interested in. If you have lamb, the cells that are in your lung um, are very destructive. We want to know why they're so destructive. And we think they're destructive because they're producing enzymes which break down the lung tissue in a very unregulated way. Um, our prime target at the moment is a protein called cathepsin K. Cathepsin K is a very strong protein-eating enzyme. And if it was expressed in an unregulated way where it shouldn't be, it could cause a huge amount of damage. And we know already that there is cathepsin K in lamb. I was going to talk about this a little bit more in her talk, but where there's brown staining in these lamb sections, that's where cathepsin K is, and we can find it, and it's been reported by others that it's there. So we already know we have quite a dangerous protease expressed in lamb tissue, and the good thing about cathepsin K is that it's druggable. Um, it's been a target for a long time because of its role in osteoporosis, so there are, there are drugs Coming up for approval, particularly this one I thieved from a Merck website, adenacatib um, is a very specific cathepsin K inhibitor that's just waiting for approval um, for treatment of osteoporosis in women. Um, so this should be available in the next couple of years. And from that, I'm going to segue into Aru's talk because Aru's going to talk about some of our, her research in the lab 
on proteases in lamb. Thank you, Debbie. Um, hello, I'm Arundhati Dongria, and um, as part of my PhD project, uh, I am responsible for um, finding out what is um, responsible for the degradation in lamb and how can we target this with a view to finding um, out novel therapies for lamb. So, um, first of all, I would like to start with saying a big thank you to all our all the women who have donated their um, tissues and blood um, as well for our, for our research, uh, because without this very valuable resource, uh, most of my work would not have been possible. So, um, uh, thank you once again. Um, so, with this donated tissue, what we are able to uh, do is we can generate these um, small little um, mini representatives of a lung known as tissue explants uh, from which we can extract RNA and from this we are able to um, study the gene expression in the lungs. Um, in, uh, via this mechanism, uh, when we studied um, the expression of several proteins, um, which are known as proteases, that are able to uh, degrade um, lung matrix and lung tissue, uh, we found that um, out of all the proteins that we looked at, cathepsin K had the highest levels in lamb lung as compared to any other protease we had um, screened. Um, and so, um, we also then looked at the levels of this protease in, in the serum of um, lamb donors, and we found that this too is expressed in a very high level. So now um, we obviously wanted to study this further um, and see um, how it is, um, you know, it, 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 I, it, can, it can degrade the tissue. And as Debbie has already mentioned, that um, it gets in case seen here by the brown um, staining is expressed in lamb, and uh, it is expressed very abundantly in lamb nodules, as seen over here, which are interesting to note, uh, quite near a cystic area. Um, so it, 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 it is possible that lung degradation could occur via this protein. So um, in order to study this protease further, um, I uh, had wanted to uh, design a, a, a lab-based 3D co-culture model uh, which, with which I can study um, LAM and the proteins involved in it much easier. I had spoken about this model last year, and um, I'm just going to go over it once again. So for this for this model, I have used a LAM cell colored red here with a, with a dye and a fibroblast. Now, fibroblasts essentially are cells that make up a lot of tissues in the body. Um, but we now believe that the fibroblasts might play a quite important role in lamb disease progression. And the lamb cell here is the cell that does not have TSC2, so it, it, is, it lacks tuberin and it carries the mutation, whereas the fibroblast is a perfectly normal cell. So when I, I, what I did was I mixed the two cells together in an extracellular matrix, which gives it an environment, which gives the two cells an environment like we might find in the lung, and um, and then embedded them together into a culture dish. And what I found that when I had got um, designed my model, this is what it looked like in 48 hours, where you can see the green uh, coloring ce colored cells as the fibroblasts and the red cells as the lamb cells. And within 72 hours, um, they come together and form um, a clump of cells. So they spontaneously come together and aggregate. And I can maintain this model for a total period of seven days uh, with full uh, viability. So all the cells are alive. Um, so another, I was developing a few other models as well to study various aspects of LAM. And um, I, just to tell you more about uh, 3D models in the lab, um, I, I, I've also um, been developing a spheroid model. Um, 
So essentially, a spheroid model uh, also again makes use of both the cell types, um, the green cells as the fibroblasts and the red lamb cells. I mix them together in a, in a culture dish, and within two to three days, they form a clump, as was evidenced in my previous 3D co-culture model, but this time a very tightly formed clump, and which are known as spheroids. And these are just some images of how this clump looks under the microscope. And this, these cell clumps are very alive because, as you can see here, that is the main clump, and you've got cells that grow out of it. So these cells are, the, these clumps can be treated as tiny little um, bits of or, uh, organs in, in, in a culture dish. Um, and a more uh, novel model that I am now developing as well is now known is known as an organoid model. Again, we use the tissue from a donor um, from donor lungs, and this tissue with un that we can that undergoes a process called enzyme digestion. We can um, create these tiny little spheres which are very tiny representatives of a diseased organ, and hence the term organoids. Um, and these organoids uh, contain a mixture of the cells that are seen in the lung. So my previous spheroid model just contained my two cell types that I had. However, this organoid model can contain every possible cell type that might be seen in the lung, like, for example, these thin spindle-shaped cells which we believe are fibroblasts and which then subsequently go ahead and multiply to quite an extent and also different morpholo different looking cells that look have a different um, shape and size. So um, these are essentially little organs that we can develop and then look at how um, what cells are in a lamb lung and how they interact. And I'm developing this model further to do so. So um, now that I've told you about the models, once again, I would like to come back to Cathepsin K because that is what I am um, carrying on pursuing with. Um, and just to give you a little brief information about what Cathepsin K is. So Cathepsin K belongs to a class of proteins um, all that are known as proteases that can degrade um, tissue in the body. Um, it's already known to degrade bone tissue during the normal bone turnover process and also excessively in osteoporosis. Um, and also, like most of the proteases, cathepsin K needs to be activated in the body to degrade tissue. So, just I in my 3D model, I wanted to study okay, the 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 source of cathepsin K and wanted to uh, identify where who is contributing to this uh, this protein. So, what cells can make this protein? Um, so when I looked at the gene expression uh, levels of cathepsin K in my 3D model, I found that these fibroblasts, which we have, uh, which we have isolated from a lamb lung, um, which now we term as lamb-associated fibroblasts, carry the highest levels of cathepsin K. So they make the highest amount of this protein as compared to the lamb cells, which, which are the, the cells that carry the mutation. So now we had um, a confirmation that uh, the, the fibroblasts uh, can produce this protein and, um, and they might be contributing to um, a degradation in the lung. Um, so we still needed to know more about the activity of this protein since it's required for its action. So I just want to let, tell you about the activity of the cathepsin, of cathepsin K. So when you have a cell and the cell gets certain signals from other surrounding cells, um, cathepsin K can be released from the, from the cells. And this cathepsin K is released in its inactive form, also known as procathepsin K. The prothecathepsin K needs to be broken down into a smaller protein with the help of certain activating factors to give its active form called active cathepsin K. Now, active cathepsin K can then act on intact 
extracellular matrix or or collagen, which is a substrate for cathepsin K, and it can degrade this intact um, collagen, which um, de then results in degraded tissue, which can result in this in 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 the lung cysts that may be that are seen. So. Um, I wanted to look at this cathepsin K activity in the lab and how I can I can measure this activity. So what I did was I gave uh, my cells um, a synthetic substrate. Uh, so uh, the cathepsin K can act on this synthetic substrate and then it gives out a distinct red fluorescent color, which you can see here. So these are my cells which, which um, have a little blue dot in the middle, and all around them uh, is this red color, which is um, active form of cathepsin K, because um, it has been acted on by the substrate. And what I did then was that I also gave my uh, one of my cells, um, put, uh, put on, uh, drugged my cells with an inhibitor of um, this class of proteins. So this inhibitor not only in can inhibit cathepsin K, but also a few other proteins like cathepsin K. And what we noticed is that this red color disappears. Um, and uh, so that means that it can be inhibited as well in, in my cells. So um, it's uh, it's possible to drug, um, but since this was a universal inhibitor, I wanted to look at the specific inhibition of cathepsin K. So and and that and and I need and I went back to my 3D co-culture model that I had spoken about, and um, I I used. Um, the the 3D mo the co culture model and and my cells on on their own, so in the 3D model you can see that there are high levels of active cathepsin K, which when treated with a specific cathepsin K inhibitor, decrease. So this cathepsin activity of cathepsin K is decreased. So and and what you can also see is that these LAM associated fibroblasts maintain the high levels of activity and LAM cells on their own do not have much activity in them. So what we concluded from this is that the, the fibroblasts are um, contributing to the activity of cathepsin K because they, produ they, they, possibly, they produce this cathepsin K which is then subsequently being activated. And uh, the, the activity is seen in the co-culture as well, so when the cells are together. Um, so both these uh, substrates that I used were synthetic, and to use a more um, relevant uh, substrate, which, were, which is a more natural substrate, I looked at collagen, which is a substrate for cathepsin K, and this collagen 1 is present in the lung. So I put my cells into a collagen gel. Um, these are the fibroblasts that I put into the collagen gel. And I also put the lamb cells into the collagen gel. And in, on day three, sorry, um, and then we, the, this is just the, to show you how big the gels are on the first day, that is day zero. Um, and then three days later, the fibroblasts have completely degraded this uh, collagen gel to this small little um, rounded ball here, whereas the lamb cells have barely even touched the, the collagen gel. So this shows that the fibroblasts are capable of degrading um, a, a, nat a more natural substrate like collagen, which is abundantly present in the lung as well, which can then possibly lead to the lung degradation. So, in oh, sorry. So, in summary, uh, from my my work so far, um, what I have what I have um, what we now believe is that um, a lamb cell is already uh, that's present within a lamb within the lung um, recruits these fibroblasts from the surrounding area when and then when these fibroblasts are recruited they produce um, increased amounts of cathepsin K which is initially inactive and this inactive cathepsin K then gets 
activated to the active form which we think might be activated with the help of other activating proteases or proteins that will that are released by a lam cell which act as the activating factors and in doing so cause de further degradation in the lung now this activation pathway is what we now need to target and could be a pos and, and could possibly be a novel therapeutic target for lam um, and it is very targetable now since there are already um, trials for uh, a few uh, compounds that inhibit this activation such as otanacatib and balicatib and lastly i would like to say thank you and a big thank you to all the lamp patients that have donated their tissue thank you very much